Thank you for joining the worship services of Shoto, Brady, and Dutton United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Julie King, and I'm so grateful for digital technology that allows you to join us from wherever you are in the world. You can join us every week by clicking the links on our Facebook at facebook.com slash Shoto UMC or on our website at umshoto.net. If you like what we are doing and would like to financially support us in ministry, you can find more contact information on our website. And again, that's umshoto.net. We're so grateful that you are joining us. Scripture this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians. It is uh, written by Paul. And Paul often is very difficult to understand. It's a different era. And to the Western ear, his uh, phraseology is often very strange. But on the back of your bulletin today is the scripture. You would like to uh, follow along. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom we did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. Well, as Terry said, this one is weird to our ear. It's hard for us to understand. On a normal year, if I was to be going through the lectionary, I probably would have read this one and said, nope, we're going to use Luke's reading this week and just skipped this reading completely because it's not one of the most familiar readings from 1 Corinthians. Unlike 1 Corinthians 13 that we had a few weeks ago where we talked about love being patient and kind and that love is the greatest gift, this one is just strange. It's talking about death and resurrection and the first fruits and it's just awkward. But I kept it in this sermon series and I wanted to talk about it today because I do think that Paul has a wonderful message in this scripture and I think it pertains to us a lot. Before we get to that though, I want to ask you all to think about a question. This is a question that I used to love pondering when I was a little kid. I used to dream about it a lot. If you won the lottery, what would you do with all that money? There's usually two big answers to this question. Either one, I suppose I need to play the lottery in order to win. Or if I did win the lottery, I'd have a big house. I'd probably buy a big cabin up in the mountains. And then because I also love the beach, I'd probably buy myself this cute beach cottage. We'd fly back and forth in between. There are a lot of parts of this world I want to see, so I would travel as much as possible. I would go check off every box on that bucket list and just travel all over. But because um, 
traveling so much would not allow my kids to go to school on a regular basis. I would also homeschool my kids and we'd have this perfect classroom set up. We'd buy fancy cars and I'm sure there would be new toys involved. We'd probably have a boat, probably some jet skis since we live in Montana now, snowmobiles. There'd be a lot of fun toys. Also, in my dream, I always think about, okay, how much of this money would I give to my parents? How much would I share with my brother? You know, I guess I have to share with him. And then somewhere, I'd start figuring up numbers of how much should I invest and how much should I give to charity and to the churches. Most of the time, that's kind of how this pondering and thinking about winning the lottery goes. My first clue though that this is very much a hypothetical dream is that homeschooling part of it though, because if there is anything I learned in COVID, it is that I absolutely do not have the desire or patience to homeschool five kids. There is no way that would happen. I think in reality, our lives would probably stay very much the same just because of that. <laughs> Most people, when they answer this question though, it usually involves big houses, fancy cars, traveling, big dreams. And when we really think about it, the thing that is most troubling to me is how far down on that list of things that we would do with the money, the church or charity or giving to others comes in. Instead, we seem to think about ourselves first and those wants, those needs that we need to have success in our world and our culture today. Most of the times in our lives, when good things come along, that's kind of how it works. We seem to think about ourselves first. If we get a job promotion, our first thought is usually, well, I did that. My skills and my hard work finally paid off. I deserve this. For farmers, if they have a really bountiful harvest, their first thought might be, well, this happened because I'm a really good farmer. I planted my seeds exactly when I should have. I figured up my irrigation just right. I harvested when I needed to. I did things right. Those that are hunters, they might think when they come home with that trophy elk or when they come home with that prize buck, it's because they are a really good shot and this was a great hunting season. For those that are fishers, well, we all know how fishing stories go, so I'm not gonna go into that, but for most people, when something really good happens in their life, God and faith are just lost somewhere back there, way beyond the back burner. They're not even placed on the back burner. For those good moments in life, we tend to think about ourselves first. It's completely opposite for those bad moments, those tragedies and hard moments in our life, because in those moments, our first cry is to God. We lament during those times and we reach out to our friends and family and ask for prayer. God is usually the first thought on our minds during a tough time. But for those good times, we relic in ourselves and our own self-satisfaction. Now it turns out that the people of Corinth we're not much different from us. During the time that Paul is writing these letters, they had got very caught up in their own ways. They had got caught up in self-satisfaction. They had lost track of their faith. And in much of Paul's letters, he gives them these wonderful ways that they are to live their lives. Remember, we talked about the spiritual gifts that all of them have. We talked about being part of the body of Christ. And of course, how to love, and this great gift of love. But last week, if you were able to join us, and just as a quick reminder, Paul talked about the ways that we need to go back to the beginning, that first moment in our faith, and how important it is for us to hold firmly to that faith. This week, he takes that a big step farther. 
Now, it might seem like a huge jump to go from spiritual gifts to the foundations of faith to the resurrection of all things, but it kind of makes sense if we think about it. Paul was inviting the community of Corinth to restart their relationship of faith with God and with one another. Something for these people had really gone off of the rails. Do you think that we could say that about our own world today? It seems like too often we look around and things are just really messed up, really, really messed up in this world. We've derailed. So Paul wants to confront all of this head on and to do it, he goes back to Jesus. When talking about the resurrection, there seems to be some argument, and I don't know that we have it figured out still today, of what happens to our own bodies after death. I don't know that I have a good understanding and can firmly say myself that I am 100% certain this is exactly what's going to happen to me after I die. I've never been to heaven, I don't know. I have my own beliefs about it, but I don't know. What we do know for sure and Paul reminds us, is that Jesus' body was resurrected. He was raised, he was seen, he spoke with them, he ate with them, he interacted with the people for what we believe to be 40 days before he transcended into heaven. Now Paul argues that this is not some ghostly spiritual resurrection, he says that this is some type of flesh, an actual human body flesh of Jesus's body being resurrected before he went into heaven. That's hard for us to understand. <laughs> That's not something that we grow up believing or thinking. And we could definitely stir up our own theologies about that. And that might be better set for a small group discussion because it is something that I'm interested in exploring sometime. But the point of Paul's scripture is this first fruits that he talks about. Paul goes on to talk about Jesus being the first fruits of those who died in this scripture. So what does this mean, these first fruits that Paul's talking about? Usually when we're talking about the first fruits, especially in Paul's time period, we're thinking of sacrifices. They're talking about the first fruits of their harvest, the first fruits of their flocks. And the first fruits, the sacrifices that they would give, usually refers to the absolute best, the prime. They would offer the best of what they had. And you have to remember, in this time period, this idea of Jesus was still new. The Old Testament scriptures were not viewed in the same way that we view them. We tend to have this mindset that the Old Testament is this history book, and yes, it's important, but then came Jesus. And what's most important for us is the Gospels and what happens after Jesus. But for them, they still held on to those New Testament scriptures. It was still very much a part of their beliefs. So Paul is talking about these sacrifices, these first fruits, and when he does this, he's pointing out that Christ was indeed the very best of this world. The very best that ever existed in human flesh. Christ was the best. And he was the very best that the flesh had to offer for the divine or the holy one. There was no better offering than Christ. Paul isn't using this phrase as a means of setting us apart from Jesus as being human. Yes, Jesus was absolutely divine and that sets him apart, but God embodied the human form and became flesh so that Jesus would be like us. And Paul is reminding us that Jesus died and then he was raised and that we have a calling to live sacrificially ourselves that we too are invited to live in this more excellent way. Paul attempts to describe this more excellent way in that very familiar scripture in chapter 13, 
with love and the ways that we are called to live of being patient and kind and not boastful and not envious. And then he realizes we kind of just get it wrong. So he goes back to the original part of our beliefs, this faith that we have in Christ. And he reminds us that we too, if we have faith, in Jesus, and we too try to live our lives in this most exceptional way, doing our very best to live our lives like Jesus, then we too will die and be raised, and that we have this promise of eternity in heaven. What does this mean for all of us? It's still kind of hard for us to understand, but what it does mean for us is that we are not called to put ourselves first. We are called to put God first. In everything that we do, all of the good that happens in our lives, we should thank God for it immediately, not put God on the back burner. For the good things that we are and the good things that happen in our life, we aren't called to be boastful and celebrate those of ourselves we are called to put others first, to use them for the good and the betterment of the world. And all of us are called to live as disciples, not just as ordinary people in this world. Paul's message is really reminding us here that this world is going to show up and offer us things that look very, very, very tempting. Things that might be a whole lot of fun to partake in. But as Christians, we are called to live above that. We are called to do better. We are not called to fall into a life of sin. Paul also reminds us that over and over and over, we are probably going to mess up. And there is this moment of forgiveness, this big part of the resurrection where Jesus did save us. And when we truly repent of our sins and we try to live a better life, we will be forgiven. And we have this promise of life in heaven. So as you think about this, as you think about the ways that we've been building character, the ways that all of these last few weeks of scriptures and Paul's writings begin to come together, I want you to think about your spiritual gifts, your place in the body of Christ here within our local church and within the global church. And then think about the ways that you could do better. The ways that you are called to make sure that you are always putting God first. That you are giving your best to God. In what ways can you do a better job of showing God's love, compassion, and have steadfast faith Not only when the going gets tough, but when things are going good. This might mean that we have to make a conscious decision to say daily prayers of gratitude. That's hard for us to remember to do sometimes. So if you're like me, maybe you're a sticky note person. I have to have reminders. If you need a reminder to help you remember to give thanks every day and in all circumstances, Maybe make a sticky note and stick it on your bathroom mirror and put that scripture, give thanks in all circumstances. It might be what you need to remember. This might mean that you have to make a conscious decision to seek the lost in this world, to seek those who are hurting, to do a better job of showing love and understanding with them more often. I just saw a quote here recently that said something along the lines of when Jesus told us to love our neighbors, he knew that our neighbors were not going to look like us or act like us, that they were going to be very different from us and that we might not always agree with them, but that was the point. We're supposed to still love them. It might mean that we consciously have to acknowledge the blessings that we have in our life. Instead of just going through the motions of each day, making a conscious effort to realize the things that we have been blessed with, and then consciously make a decision to use those blessings as a blessing for others. 
as we've talked about building character, as we've talked about this way of growing in our own faith to do better ourselves, I hope that in all that you do, you will give God your first fruits, the best that you have, not just your tithes and physical authoring, offerings, but the best that you have in your being, the goodness and love in you, that you will strive to live your life in a more excellent way, and that you will always remember that God absolutely loves you, and he has called you and created you to be his disciple. Amen. For our hymn of reflection this morning, we will be singing Pass It On. And I would invite all of you to stand as we join together in singing this. It's number 572 in your hymnal if you'd like to follow along in there. a spark to get a fire going and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing that's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it you spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on what a wondrous time is spring when all the trees are budding the birds begin to sing the flowers start their blooming that's how it is with God's love Once you've experienced it You want to sing It's fresh like spring You want to pass it on I wish for you, my friend This happiness that I have to me I want to pass it on 